The Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, before we have a welcome address from the president, I would just like to say that this program is being sponsored by the college's EOS Student Club in cooperation with the Poetry Center. And the reading itself is going to be f is funded in part by a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts. I'm sorry, I'm from New York City, pardon me. The New Jersey Council on the Arts. <laughs> Native New York, it never goes away. President Collins. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to uh, say how happy I am to have a chance to uh, say welcome. We have Ms. Shirley Ann Williams here who will be introduced to you shortly. Sometimes when I have the time, and I seem to have less of that lately, I have the time to teach a course in African American history. And of course, as you might expect from uh, those of you who are students and, and have had college history courses, one will study such topics as the American Revolution, the Civil War, the post-Civil War period, etc. But I always tell the students that there is one area which we do not cover in a standard history class which gives great insight into African American history. And that is through the study of, of poems, novels, books, literature in general. And of course, today we have a person who will give us great insight into our history, into our struggles, and into our presence in this country, and that is Ms. Shirley Ann Williams. There is a place in African American history which is called the Harlem Renaissance, which started in the 1920s. And of course, you hear of such names as Paul Lawrence Dun Dunbar, County Cullen, Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, and many, many other people. Shirley Ann Williams comes out of the Harlem Renaissance movement. She reflects the, feeling, the feelings, the pains, and the aspirations of African people in the United States. So today you will, through literature, through poems, and through the spoken voice, hear about our people and their struggle. I salute Ms. Williams for coming, and I salute you for taking the time out from your lunch schedule and your class schedules to come. And without further ado, I'll turn the program back over to the Mistress of Ceremonies. Thank you. Before Ms. Williams begins to read, I would just like to give a brief introduction for those who may not be familiar with the work. Shirley Ann Williams is a noted author who has the distinction of publishing widely acclaimed works in three literary genres. She's published criticism, poetry, and fiction. She's a native of California and while in college, Ms. Williams was a major, I'm sorry, majored in history. She received her bachelor's degree from Fresco State University. She attended graduate school at Brown University where she received her master's degree in English. She has been an educator as well as a poet and a writer for more than 20 years and has taught both black studies and literature. Currently, she is a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. Given this background, it should come as no surprise that the blending of these three history, literature, education, and her commitment to recording black culture seem to be the moving force in Ms. Williams' work. Her books of poetry, The Peacock Poems, which was nominated for the 1976 National Book Award, and Someone's Sweet Angel Child, recall a history of the recent past and not so recent past. While Desert Rose, her much praised first novel, was inspired by two events from the antebellum South all are characterized by her powerful lyrical style. She affects a romance with the language that can be warm and sunny, hot and passionate, or indignant and belligerent. But through it all shines the sensitivity of Shirley Ann Williams, whose mission is recording the present, enriching the past, and creating a solid base for the future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Shirley Ann Williams. Thank you. 
so you can okay. hold them in. Can I make an announcement? Yeah, you can stand right Okay. Good afternoon to our distinguished poet artist, Ms. Shirley Ann Williams. Please accept our sincere thanks for a most refreshing hour. On behalf of Professor Harrington and all of her students here at Passaic Community College, I am pleased to present this corsage to you. Please wear it as an expression of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to the same way. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. I bring you uh, greetings from a, a board member of the Poetry Center, uh, Professor Quincy Troop, who has recently joined the faculty at our university, University of California at uh, San Diego. And I want to thank everyone uh, responsible for my visit, in particular, uh, Maria Gillen. Uh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. I want to start by um, reading uh, a couple of new poems. And since this is um, Black History Month, I will read some from Dessa Rose, which is a historical novel uh, set uh, in the antebellum period during the time when most uh, people of African descent in this country were still uh, held as slaves. This is called uh, Answer to Your Question. Answer to Your Question. Shirley, is that you? The darkened eye restored, filling the body with light. Is that me? Owning my name with our people's response to a hail from outside the house. Is that me? Neither affirming nor denying and every member rejoiced in a single segment made whole with its circle in the recognition of the single voice. Yes, Lawson, this is me. I was privileged as a, a student, a graduate student, and as an undergraduate to study with uh, two of uh, this country's uh, finest uh, poets, um, Robert Hayden at Fisk University and Sterling Brown at um, Howard University. I always say, I've said before, that Philip Levine, the um, Anglo-American poet uh, with whom I studied at my undergraduate school, Fresno State, uh, taught me something about writing a poem. And Robert Hayden, the Afro-American poet with whom I studied <laughs> at Fisk University, taught me how to read a poem. But it was Sterling Brown, uh, Professor Sterling Brown of Howard University, a poet and a critic who gave me, I think, a real sense of my own voice and uh, a belief in myself as a poet. And so this is a poem that's dedicated to Professor Sterling Brown. It's called DC Visions, The Verified Tongue. For Sterling, you know you was my dream. My tongue break like water. The breeze turn me all around. The streets come down so heavy, my mind don't know what all my eyes have seen. Who known me? Who wore my name? This land rode me. That road lead me here. And you some dream I didn't even know I was dreaming. In your face I trace my father's. I listen at my mother's voice. And each time like the first time I come to that house, Miss Daisy meet me at the gate. She have my sister's walk. The bridge over P Street, that old half-assed hill, the valley up at Howard. My heart do live in the stillness of the city. This city hold me in silence. Each separate sound be some song. And I tremble and moan in this warm darkness. I tremble and moan at such peace. I spent some time in uh, Ghana, as, uh, in Ghana, West Africa, as a Fulbright uh, lecturer at the University of Ghana at, at Legon. And this is one of the poems to come out of that experience. It's called An Afro-American Returns to the Continent and subtitled 
the market at Medina. Uh, Medina is a small town outside of the capital city um, at uh, uh, Accra. And of course, in much of uh, West Africa, they have open air uh, markets. And so this grew out of an incident. Uh, a friend came one day uh, to take me to the market so that I could have the experience of going and of bargaining uh, for things in, in the open air. And they came to pick me up in what they said was they were going to send a car for me. And it turns out that at that time, at least in, in Ghana and West Africa, car was kind of like a generic term for anything on wheels. And what was actually sent for me was a Volkswagen uh, truck. At any rate, this is called the market at Medina. Marked by truck and driver, we progress down rutted, unpaved roads, are directed to market. Conscious of our careless carriage, we descend, marked now by sage, by sage, shades and brown skin, Oberuni and woman of some big man. Sister, the market sisters call, pointing to waxy red palm fruit, elongated tubers of sandy brown yams, mounds of pale powdered cassava. Assaulted by pungent aromas, dried shrimp, fresh fish, the sickly sweet odor of human waste and vegetable decay. We walk between stalls of dusty color. Sister, the sisters call. Madame, their voices say. This isn't the face of some expatriate, I could tell them. This is the color of former slaves. Ama is the real fair lady. Silent behind my shades, I follow her lead. We are fair game. She the been too, I a got it made. A bag of gari, a palm frond fan, two combs the driver has bargained for us. For such small purchases we came, parading privilege, power, sick delusions of a dying age. Oh, sister, the sisters say. I never thought home would be like this. Dirt almost as red as an open wound, redder than Georgia, people purple in their blackness and blue and brown. These suburbs like the five points in Jericho's of childhood. Bass Ackwards, haphazard collections of houses huddled away from the sky, me trapped inside progress and shades, speechless, afraid. I want to read now from um, my first book of poetry called uh, The Peacock Poems. And this is a poem called Care of Ambush, Care of Mike. And despite the fact that it is now almost uh, two decades old, it remains one of my favorite poems. Um, I guess the poems that you write for friends always hold a place in your heart. The rain slick summer streets was never really deserted, and I drove them. I would trip through neon lit city nights trying to make it fast through all my young woman years till I could be old and not be called on to love no man but just to have what I have suffice and all this wanton be covered by a spreading body buried in an old woman heart. My mind was taking me through so many changes and they really wasn't my men's was too old to play at being my sons. They was brothers in the way we want to think they all can be when a woman need a man. Not just for bedding or even holding, but to say in some other way, you is woman to my man. So I was care of ambush or of Mike. I would feel and they would feel and sometimes speak, always listen jump into my case, give me back me in a new relation to myself. They dark, devilish faces would smile or go quiet and always they eyes, well, they'd be lovely. Fierce, but holding a young and aged peace. And I love their young bodies and the cleanness of their soul and all that beauty we guess at, cause we can't ever know the whole, but just sense it in they walk, in they stand, in they flash and smiles, they quiet and lovely eyes.
We were, Maria and I were talking um, as we drove to school um, this morning about events in the world and marveling over the way in which uh, language has been kind of uh, destroyed uh, by the war in the Gulf so that um, we don't talk about civilian casualties, we talk about collateral uh, damage. And that put me in mind of a poem that I wrote in, <coughs> published in this volume called The Collateral Adjective. Now some of you may know that in um, grammar, a collateral adjective is an adjective that does not, is not based on the root of the noun uh, word that it defines. Uh, let's see, uh, I can't even think of a noun and an adjective that would not be a collateral adjective at this point. But anyway, uh, the word peacock is the noun, but the adjective for it is not peacocky, but rather pavanine. And so it's based on that kind of distinct distinction. This is called the collateral adjective. I sing my song in a cycle around, spiral up, spiral down. The adjective has little to do with the noun. The round is showy and loud, proud like the noun. It designates person, place, thing. To find place called name and thing is a greased pole so much to gain and nothing to lose. The noun has all the lines and the lines, they cover all the pain. Spiral up, spiral down. Cycle the round, circle the song. Without a drum that sings soprano, the tongue's only a wagging member in the void of the mouth, speechless in the face of what it has said. I never, never thought to sing this song. The adjective, the noun, this is not my idea of a game. This is a little poem that is um, based on rhythm. It's actually a kind of takeoff on an old Aretha Franklin uh, song called This is the Knock on Your Door. And I wanted to suggest in this poem some of the kind of um, a careless confidence that I feel uh, is epitomized in that particular uh, song. This is a rap on your door. After you've been with somebody, somebody that been digging on you, it'd be a long time for you can be with somebody new. Somebody, yeah, take a long time to get with somebody that's new. You don't be hungry for just any old lips. No, not for somebody new. No, not just for somebody. Some old lips just cause they new. I ain't been with nobody cause I want the one I knew. No, I ain't been with nobody new, but still I'm hungry for a body. Yeah, so hungry, but just only hungry for you. Okay, this, uh, This is a poem for um, my sister. It's actually a part of a, a longer poem um, that's it called I Sing This Song for Our Mothers, and I'll read the, the initial poem in the sequence uh, later. But this, this one is called uh, Ruiz, and as I say, it's for um, my older sister. I never thought to see us grow old, our waist thicken, our children move so quickly toward being women and men. I have, of course, but to see the woman of your hands is not to know the girl who took the woman me in, saw so clearly what it was that would save me for myself, and so let me be a child again. The long-waisted body, the long, straight neck will soon disappear in folds of aging flesh, but not age, not added flesh, not even death could wipe away what the strength of your love and anger trace in the still deepening earth tones of your face. 
I have no daughters to be the woman you are, and your own is still becoming. Aerated loam and fire, the song some bird will sing, sum and homage, sister, 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 been and is. The novel Dessa Rose grew out of a short story um, that I completed in the mid uh, 70s and that I had absolutely no success in publishing. Uh, part of, partly I think that at the time I was working on this, um, this story, it was inconceivable that an illiterate black woman would be able to best in any kind of way uh, an educated uh, white man. And so many of the editors had difficulty uh, believing you know, in the credibility of the story. I'm glad to say that uh, since that time, our um, imaginations have been expanded to the point uh, where we can readily uh, believe that such a thing uh, could happen. But despite my difficulty in getting the story published, and it was eventually published by Mary Helen Washington in the anthology Midnight Birds, but despite that initial difficulty, I couldn't give up the story of, of Dessa Rose, of this uh, slave girl uh, who had managed to escape uh, from slavery, uh, who, was, who had participated in an uprising on a slave coffle, and who was being held in captivity uh, until the birth of her baby, whereupon she, would, she was to be uh, executed. And while she was waiting for the birth of her baby and her own death, uh, she was being interrogated by a white man who wanted to use her story to write his book. As I say, I couldn't let uh, that story, I couldn't let that, that, that woman go. And this is one of the poems that, as a kind of interim measure, I wrote even as I was thinking about how I would continue, um, how I would continue her story in novel form. It's called, I Sing This Song for Our Mothers, and the subtitle is, I'm Odessa's son, and then the second part of it is called Odessa. I was a man full growed when the other folks freedom come, had a wife and sons of my own, and what nary a one of us ever belongs to no one but herself. I tell you now what my ma say, just the way she tell it to me. I want you to tell it to your woman, to your sons, to your daughters, most especial, cause this where our line come from, sister. Sister, blood, blood, sister. Sound and wind as it roars through fire, the still of the earth as it soaks up rain, all. Odessa, they come to get me in the night, the brothers. I tell you how their name is called. Big Nathan, he was side of me on the chain. Proud Cully would have the file and Harker would be the daddy to you now. Jemina give them the key and say she be with us by and by. Say to me, praise the Lord, you and your child be free. I say, Jemina, this what in my belly, and that was you. Be free with me in heaven or hell, but we don't neither one be no more slaves in this here world. Harker say, talk make us all slaves, we don't mind out. Us got to catch the path while it's still dark. We two days on the trail. I had you in the wilderness underneath a tree. Nathan and Cully hold my hand while Harker birthed you. And when the pain got so bad, I call the name of the man what put you here. I say your name now, and that be love. I say your daddy name, and that be how I know free. I say Harker name, and that be how I keep love and keep free. Keep me, sister, earth, and loam of heaven, spring song in the passion bird's throat, sister, sister, blood, all. As you know, suggested in the poem, Dessa Rose does manage to escape from where she is being held in captivity. Uh, she escapes with uh, the help of uh, a couple of her comrades from the slave coffle who have themselves managed to elude uh, the posse. She's taken to the farmhouse of, an isolated farmhouse that is owned by 
a white woman named Ruth Elizabeth, who to all intents and purposes has been abandoned by her own husband. And because she has no choice, Ruth Elizabeth, or Ruthel as she calls herself, uh, has uh, started taking in uh, other runaway or escaped slaves uh, with the idea that she gives them sanctuary in exchange for them working the farm for us. And when Dessa is first brought to her, uh, she sees in Dessa uh, this, uh, a kind of reincarnation of her trusted and beloved uh, servant, Mammy, who has but recently died. Uh, and she expects to take up with Dessa the same kind of relationship that she has had with her trusted servant, Mammy. On the other hand, when Dessa wakes up and sees uh, this white woman, uh, she sees Ruth Elizabeth as kind of the reincarnation of everything that she has been taught to hate uh, and to fear. And so that sets the stage for their relationship. And uh, the novel is largely concerned with how, in fact, given this kind of start and given their very unequal circumstances, they can come to have some kind of respect uh, and trust for each other. The part that I'm going to read to you now has to do, it takes up as Dessa is returning to uh, consciousness. She has been um, under severe stress. Uh, she's just had a baby out uh, in the wilderness and she wakes up to find herself in this white woman's bed. The days drifted by. Dessa slept, waking to the colored woman's gruff urgings to eat, eat, the taste of some strongly flavored broth, the mealy texture of cereal thinned, Dessa thought, with milk, the changing of the bloody cloth. Acutely embarrassed and weak as a kitten, Dessa bore the woman's gentle touch. Often, Dessa woke to find the baby asleep in the curve of her arm. Hand heavy, powerless to caress him, she pursed her lips and breathed him love, or opened her eyes to some smiling face, dark, peach-colored, hair like night or the sun, whose name she ought to know. She would grin feebly. They would pat her arm. Nathan, she would think. Cully, but already they were gone. The colored woman chatted in a companionable way as she tended Dessa. Not enough to require an answer or force Dessa to questions, but she did listen, her mind holding enough to know the baby was doing well, the white woman meant no harm, she could sleep. She did not dream, but she became cautious in her waking. The white woman seemed often in her room. And now, and Dessa woke now and then to find, her, find the white woman settled in the rocker, hands quiet in her lap, dreamy-eyed, looking toward Dessa, but apparently talking to herself. Bonnet, Dessa heard several times. Half listening, fascinated, she watched the red mouth move. She knew she could understand what the white woman said if she would let herself. But if she understood the white woman, she would have to, have to, have to do something and picnic, the white woman said. Dessa wanted to laugh. Where did you go to pick nits? Or was that something else only white folks did? Dessa appeared at the white woman. Her dress looked neat enough. So they had bugs, just like some trashy buckra or, or freshwater negro who didn't know enough to keep clean. Mammy? That made no sense. Mammy's name came up often. What could this white woman know of Mammy, Dessa thought, or Mammy of dropped waist and Dutch sleeves, unless these were cows? Once Dessa woke in arms, her face tangled in a skein of fine webbing that seemed alive. It clung and itched her skin so bad. She almost suffocated in her terror, for she knew the white woman held her, and they were together in the big feather bed. And really, it was the white woman's breathing that saved her, brought her to her senses, its calm regularity imposing odd order on her own wildly beating heart. That breathing, punctuated by a drawn out sigh of utter satisfaction and the small fragile bundle that nestled at her spine. Turning cautiously, moving with infinite patience, Dessa inched herself and the baby toward the edge of the bed. Squirming carefully into the soft mattress, she managed to nudge out a slight rise between herself and the other woman who, still breathing regularly, had likewise turned away. 
What kind of place had she come to, Dessa thought, as her heart thudded against her ribs. Her fingers touched briefly the satiny hair, the thin velvet of her baby's skin. It was a long time before she slept again. The colored woman's name was Ada, Dessa realized one morning. The long windows had begun to gray with dawn light. No conch or bell sounded here. People must get up with the rooster's crow. This was the Sutton place, except Master Sutton wasn't here. Ada called the white woman Ms. Ruin. There was something funny about the way Ada said the name, as though, was the white woman crazy? Dessa sweated. The thin stuff of her shift clung to her. Shift? Dessa clutched at the garment. She had never in her life owned cloth as fine as the material her hand rubbed against her side. She moved uneasily between the unbelievable smoothness of the sheets. The white woman's breathing was barely audible in the stillness. Maybe she was crazy, Dessa thought, but not a killer. No, not a killer. Nathan and Cully would not have brought her here. Not a killer, but touched, maybe. Strange in the head. What else could explain her own presence in this bed? Touched, and Ada said, Miss Ruink said, the master was coming home this harvest for sure. The other woman had laughed quietly. Ada said the white woman had said the same thing about master's return last year, and he hadn't come. Dessa remembered that. Ada had rolled her eyes as if to say, Dessa couldn't quite put her finger on it. Crazy, maybe, she assured herself now, but not no killer. Ada spoke also of Dorcas. In her mind's eye, Dessa saw a thin, lone-colored face surmounted by a tangle of even darker hair. No, that was Annabelle, Ada's daughter, seldom seen and then only briefly, a slender figure who hummed quietly and showed no interest in Dessa. Dorcas was someone Ada quoted, someone Dessa didn't think she had yet seen. Never mind, she told herself. Her hand moved to soothe the baby. There had to be someplace else to sleep. She would ask Ada. Neither Ada nor her daughter belonged to the white woman. None of them did. Ada's words plucked at Dessa's attention. Ada's face beneath her bandana was placid, and Dessa wondered if she had heard right. Free? Dessa wondered silently as she watched Ada stir the bowl she held. Dessa tried to de gesture, but her hand fell limply to her side. She swallowed. Y'all, she croaked. Ada paused with the spoon halfway to Dessa's mouth. Free? Ada asked, smiling, brown eyes looking closely at Dessa as she replaced the spoon in the bowl untouched. Cat let loose your tongue, huh? Come on, it's just a bit more. She stirred the remaining grits and lifted another spoonful toward Dessa. Come on, eat up. Dessa opened her mouth obediently. The grits had been thinned with milk and seasoned with butter, and Dessa held a spoonful in her mouth, savoring the richness. I wouldn't exactly call it free, Ada said doubtfully. We run away, she added brightly, as though this explained it all. She let us stay here. She need the hep. Man gone, slaves run off. Ada shrugged and smiled. White folks think we hers, but then none of us never belongs to this place. She spooned the last of the cereal into Dessa's mouth and rose. Ada, Dessa managed to grasp a fold of the woman's skirt. Ada, sleep with you? She struggled to one elbow, then fell back weakly, her eyes seeking to hold the other woman's. Me and the baby? She couldn't spend another night in the white woman's bed. Honey, Ada bent over her, eyes warm with concern. Honey, me and Annabelle sleeps in that little lean-to they calls a kitchen, and it's just barely big enough for us, and it ain't no wise fitting. You ain't even out of child bed. Quarters we could, worse than a chicken run. Ada sat on the bed, stroking Dessa's hand. Tell you, honey, these some poor white peoples. Oh, this room and the parlor fine enough, but you know what's outside that door? A great big stairway leads straight up to nothing cause they never did finish the second floor. Ada laughed. The quarters is a cabin, one side for the women's, one side for the men's. Side, she added, when Dessa would have protested further, she the only nursing woman on the place. Even if you go, you ought to leave the, woman, the baby here. Dessa had suspected from the way the baby turned from her fretting and in tears that she had no milk to speak of. Her baby, nursing, Dessa's breathing quickened and her heart seemed to pound in her ears. 
There was more, but Dessa turned away. Ada talked as much to herself as she did to Dessa, almost in the same way that the white woman did, never really expecting an answer. Already, she seemed to have forgotten that Dessa had spoken. Dessa surrendered to the familiar lassitude, runaways, Ada, Harker, how many others? And the white woman let them set, stay, nursed? Dessa knew the white woman nursed her baby. She had seen her do it. It went against everything she had been thought to think about white women, but to inspect that fact too closely was almost to deny her own existence. That the white woman had let them stay, even that was almost too big to think about. Sometimes it seemed to Dessa that she was drowning in milky skin, ensnared by red hair. There was a small mole on the white woman's forehead, just above one sandy eyebrow. She smelled faintly of some scent that Dessa couldn't place. Why had they all run here? Because she let them stay? Why had she let them stay? Behind. She was that put out about it, too. The white woman was, snow was sewing this time, setting big, careless stitches in a white cloth draped over her knees. Against her will, Dessa listened. Night of the St. Cecilia dinner, and of course, Mammy had to dress mother for that. No white woman like this had ever figured in Mammy's conversations, Dessa thought drowsily, and this would have been something to talk about. Dinner and gowns, not just plain dresses. All by myself and scared to the Winstons was related to royalty or maybe it was only just a night. The white woman paused a minute. Now often as Daphne told it, you'd think I'd know it by heart. She shook her head and laughed softly. Mammy would know it. Maybe, Dessa thought with a sudden pang. Mammy hadn't known about Cain, about Master Sel and Jeter. Mammy doubted that. When it all happened so long ago, there wasn't no one alive now who witnessed it. I seen it, Dessa started to say. Master sold Jeter to the traitor, same as Mistress sold me. But the white woman continued without pause. The pretty clothes? Well, I know Mammy didn't know a thing about history, but I knew she was right about the clothes. She used to dress me so pretty. Even the Reynolds girls and their daddy owned the bank. Everyone said they wore drawers made out of French silk. They used to admire my clothes. Dessa stared at the white woman. She was crazy, making up this whole thing like, like, pretend their clothes came from a fashionable modiste. But I always said, oh, this is a little something Mammy ran up for me. So when I walked into the Great Hall at Winston, I had on a dress that Mammy made and it was Mammy's. Wasn't no Mammy to it. The words burst from Dessa. She knew, even as she said it, what the white woman meant. <coughs> Mammy was a servant, a slave, Dorcas, who had nursed the white woman as Carrie had nursed young mistress's baby before it died. But Goaded by the white woman's open mouth stare, she continued, Mammy ain't made you nothing. Why, she, the white woman stopped, confused. Hurt seemed to spread like a red stain across her face. Seeing it, Dessa lashed out again. You don't even know Mammy. I do so, the white woman said indignantly. Papa give her, Mammy live on the Vonham Plantation near Simeon on the Beaufort River, McAllen County. This was what they were taught to say if some white person asked them their name and what place they belonged to. The white woman gaped, like a fish, Dessa thought contemptuously, just like a fish out of water. Anybody could make this white woman's wits go gathering. My, my, my mammy, the white woman sputtered. The words exploded inside Dessa. Your mammy? Never, never had that white baby taken Jessup's place with Carrie. Your mammy? No white girl could ever have taken her place in Mammy's bosom. No one. You ain't got no Mammy, Dessa stabbed. I do. I did so. The white woman was shouting now, the white cloth crushed in her trembling hands. All you know about is this kind of sleeve and that kind of bonnet, some party here. Didn't you have no peoples where you lived? Mammy ain't nobody's name, not the real one. The white woman's baby started to cry, and the white woman made as if to rise and go to it. Dessa's voice overrode the tearful wail, seeming to pin the white woman in the chair. See, see, you don't even know Mammy's name. Mammy have a name, have children. 
She didn't. The white woman, finger stabbing toward her own heart, finally rose. She just had me. I was like her child. What was her name then, Dessa taunted. Child don't even know its own mammy's name. What was mammy's name? What? Mammy, the white woman yelled. That was her name. Her name was Rose, Dessa shouted back, struggling to sit up. That's a flower so red it looked black. When Mammy was a girl, they named her that count of her skin, smooth black, and they teased her about her breath cause she worked around the dairy, said it smelled like cow milk, and her mouth was slick as butter, her kiss tangy as clabber. You are lying, the white woman said coldly. She was shaking with fury. Liar, she hissed. Dessa heaved herself to her knees, flinging her words in the white woman's face. Mammy gave birth to 10 children that come in the world living. She counted them off on her fingers. The first one rose after herself. The second one died before the white folks named it. Mammy called her Minta after a cousin she met once. Seth was the first child lived to go into the fields. Little Rose died while Mammy was carrying Amos, carried off by the diphtheria. Thank God he spared Seth. Remembering the names now, the way Mammy used to tell them, lest they forget, she would say, lest her poor lost children die to living memory as they had in her world. Amos lived for a week one Easter. Seemed like he blighted the wound. Not another one lived till she had Bess. Mammy telling the names until speech became too painful. Them was the two she left, Seth and Bess. Seth was sold away when she come with old mistress to the Reeves place, sold away like Jeter, whose real name was Samuel after our daddy. Only Carrie kept saying Jeter when she meant Junior, and that was the name he kept. Bess, born two years before old mistress married old Master Reeves, left because she was sickly, died before Rose reached her new home. Even buried under years of silence, Dessa could not forget. She had started on the names of the dead before she realized that the white woman had gone. Both children were crying now, but Dessa's voice continued through their noise. Jeffrey died the first year she come to the Reeves plantation. Caesar, two years older than Carrie, head kicked in by a horse he was holding for some guest. Carrie was the first child born at the new place to live. Dessa, Dessa Rose, the baby girl. Anger spent now, she wept. Oh, I pray God, Mammy still got Carrie Mae left. And this final one from the Peacock Poems. Thank you. This is called the Peacock Song. They don't like to see you with your tail dragging low, so I try to hold minds up high. No one want to know where you go until after you been. And even though I told him, ain't nobody heard how a peacock gonna speak. I got no tongue. Here I come with my pigeon-toed strut and my head is up for balance. And so they can look in my eyes. See that star? That was from Beg and that callus come from brushing against all the someones I met on my way to Ben. Or is it Am? I never do know. but. I was trying to make them feel that I need a little heart rubbing, soul scrubbing. This is real, but if I'm a peacock, my feather's supposed to cover all hurts. And if you want to stay one, then you got to keep that tail from dragging. So mine's is always held up sky high. Thank you. <laughs>